The murders of two men in rural Georgia creates a haunting legend, with rumours of rape, the drugging of people with LSD and satanic worship. Our moment in crime is the case of the Corpsewood Manor murders. Was the guilt becoming too much, or did Samuel Tony West turn himself in because he knew the law was after him? It was Christmas Eve 1982, and the 30-year-old had only just arrived in Chattanooga, Tennessee, when he spoke to police officer Jean Haas in the parking lot of the Palomino Club Lounge. Three people were dead, and West was one half of two murderers. But West's confession wasn't believed until the Rossville Police Department in Rossville, Georgia, confirmed he was a wanted man. West was no stranger to crime. At the age of 13, West shot and killed his two-year-old nephew, Horace Lee Haygood, while playing with a loaded gun. According to West's family, the death of his father in a train accident when West was 10 badly affected him, and after Horace's death, he spent time in a mental hospital until he turned 18. As an adult, he escaped from jail while serving time for theft and shot his brother-in-law. West met his accomplice in November 1982. Kenneth Avery Brock was a 17-year-old part-time truck driver. He moved into West's trailer not long after meeting him. It was Brock who told West about two men who lived in a house in the woods. West and Brock came to believe that the two men must have a fortune hidden somewhere on their property, and that fortune had the names West and Brock written all over it. The property in question was located near the small town of Trion, Georgia, and it belonged to Dr Charles L. Scudder and his companion, Joseph Joey Odom. Charles was born on the 6th of October 1926 in Wisconsin to Captain Charles Morrison Scudder, a hydraulic and mechanical engineer, and Eleanor Lee Scudder. He had an older sister, Janet, and married Helen Kilborn at the age of 19. The marriage, however, didn't last. A marriage to Borte Bunting, the daughter of British poet Basil Bunting, produced four sons named Saul, Gideon, Fenris and Ahab. Charles was well educated, earning degrees in zoology, languages and chemistry before earning his PhD in pharmacology in 1964. At Loyola University in Chicago, Charles became a professor of pharmacology and later earned an assistant directorship role at the Stritches Institute for the Study of Mind, Drugs and Behaviour. As part of this job, Charles ran government-funded experiments with psychoactive drugs, believed to include LSD. It's unclear if Charles' marriage to Bote ended in her death or divorce. It is clear that Charles met Joey Odom in Chicago in 1959. Joey was from Illinois and was born on the 27th of March, 1938. While serving time in jail, he discovered he had a talent for cooking. Joey helped to look after Charles's home, and in a 1981 Mother Earth News article, Charles credited Joey with helping him raise his children. Sadly, Ahab died in 1970, and it seems that Charles became estranged from his surviving children. His will was entirely in favour of Joey. The turning point in Charles' life came on his 50th birthday. In an article titled A Castle in the Country, Charles explained his reasons for moving to rural Georgia. 
He was fed up of city life, paying taxes and bills, office politics and students who showed no interest in learning. In 1975, Charles bought some land in Georgia for $10,500. He sold his Chicago home, gave away his electrical possessions and handed in his resignation on his 50th birthday. When he left his office for the final time, Charles took with him three vials of government-grade LSD-25. Joey happily followed Charles across the country. It has never been clear if the men were in a relationship or if they were just companions. But regardless of whether or not Charles and Joey were in love, the men's determination to be different and to live the lives they wanted would go on to fuel rumours of homosexual satanic worship. The founder of the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey, would later say that the murders of Charles and Joey were proof that some areas of the US were places where eccentric individuals could be targeted for having different beliefs. But Charles was happy with his decision to live life how he wished. He said, The change was like crawling out of an old, outworn skin. As Charles and Joey drove down a logging road near the land Charles had purchased, they came across the body of a horse. After this, anyone needing directions to the house in the woods would be told to drive down Dead Horse Road. The barren trees that Charles and Joey saw when they first set eyes on the land gave their new home its name, Corpsewood Manor. Corpsewood took two years to build. While the house was built, the pair lived in a camper van. Charles built most of Corpsewood himself, as Joey was recovering from injuries he sustained in a car accident on Dead Horse Road. Charles and Joey wanted to live off the land, creating a pond, building a beehive and grinding their own wheat. The finished house was oval shaped and 44 by 16 feet. The kitchen, dining room and library were downstairs and the upstairs housed separate bedrooms for Charles and Joey as well as a hall that led to a drawbridge. The drawbridge led to a gazebo. Also on the property was a three-storey building that housed chickens on the ground floor, a storeroom and a pornographic library on the middle floor and a room known as the pink room on the top floor. This room had mattresses on the floor, contained sex toys and was lit by oil lamps and candles. Witnesses said that sex parties were held on the top floor, which also involved homemade wine and LSD. However, no one who visited the pink room claimed to have been drugged with LSD by Charles and Joey. This was what West and Brock claimed when they stood trial for murder. At the time that Charles and Joey were murdered, the satanic panic was in full swing. Many were convinced that devil worshippers were everywhere. A local sheriff had once tried to bring charges against the men because they lived different lives, but was unable to because of freedom of religion. After their murders, the media referred to the men as devil worshippers. The contents of Cobbswood Manor further fueled rumours about Charles and Joey. Renaissance-era furniture was favoured by Charles. A gold and black statue of Mephistopheles and horned and fanged statues decorated the house. The four chimneys were decorated with pentacles pointing down, as were the doors on a jeep the men owned. Stained glass windows had depictions of Baphomet and a Medusa-like skull. Charles also owned the Satanic Bible, and some believe that Charles had invoked a demon to protect Corpsewood. 
They said that a sign outside the house that read, Beware of the thing, proved that a demon was lurking on the property. But perhaps the sign referred to one of Charles's two English mastiffs. Sometimes the truth is much simpler. Charles and Joey were friends with the locals. One friend had a daughter who visited Corpsewood as a child and thought of it as a magical place. By the time the 12th of December 1982 came along, Kenneth Brock had been visiting Corpsewood over the past few weeks. Brock apparently met Charles and Joey while deer hunting on their property. Brock began to get to know the men, and by the time December arrived, he hoped to gain access to the main house. He wanted to get to know the layout of the building, and be on the lookout for money and valuables. Brock wasn't aware that any money the men had was kept in a bank account, and that they used cheques to pay for everything. But Brock was never allowed access to the main house. Charles and Joey let very few people inside their home. Charles was 56 years old when he was killed. Joey was 37. On the day of the murders, Brock borrowed his mother's 22 caliber rifle. He told her he was going rabbit hunting. Brock then watched football at West's sister's trailer. It was there that Brock and West convinced West's nephew, Joey Lavon Wells, and his date, Teresa Hudgens, to head over to Corpsewood with them. Brock later claimed that Wells helped to plan the murders, something that Wells denied. The group arrived at Corpsewood in West's Javelin, and on the way over they huffed Tootaloo, a mix of paint thinner, glue and alcohol. Charles greeted them. Joey was in the kitchen. The group were allowed into the pink room by Charles. Wine was the drink of choice, and eventually Brock stood up, saying he was going to fetch more Tootaloo. He ignored Wells' attempts to stop him. When Brock returned, he had the rifle with him. After 20 minutes passed by, Charles stood to attend to an oil lantern. Brock saw his chance. Brock grabbed Charles by the hair, pulling his head back and put a knife to his throat. It seems that Charles initially thought this was a prank, at least until Brock tied his arms behind his back with strips of a sheet he cut up and passed them through holes he'd cut in the sleeves of Charles's coat. Brock demanded to know where the money was. Charles told him there wasn't any on the property. Hudgens became upset when Brock responded by tying Charles up even more. Worried about her, Charles asked Hudgens if she was alright. She told him he needed to worry about himself. At this point, Wells and Hudgens tried to flee. Wells convinced West to join them. But the car wouldn't start, and West saw this as a sign that the plan was supposed to happen. The three of them returned to the pink room. Both West and Brock began to demand that Charles tell them where the money was kept. But as he was getting nowhere with Charles, Brock decided to focus on Joey and headed to the kitchen. Although there was no evidence that Joey had a gun nearby, Brock said that he shot Joey when he reached for his own gun. When Charles was brought into the house a short time later, he saw that both of his dogs had been shot dead as they slept next to the wood heater. Joey had been shot once in the arm and four times in the head. Charles was forced into the library and was once again asked for money. Before being shot, Charles is reported to have said, quote, I asked for this, end quote. No one knows exactly what Charles meant by this. 
When Charles tried to make his way over to Joey, West shot him in the face. When Charles tried to stand, West shot him four times in the head. West and Brock then put some valuables in pillowcases, including a leather jacket, flasks of wine, silver candelabras and a gold-plated dagger with a jewel-encrusted handle. The heavy furniture couldn't be moved and a gold harp wouldn't fit in the vehicles. Statues and artwork were left behind. They both missed the three vials of LSD-25 in a desk drawer. When Weston Brock went to leave, they heard Charles make a few noises. Brock shot him in the forehead with a 22 caliber revolver that belonged to Charles. They then realised that Joey was still alive. Joey had dragged himself from the kitchen and into the dining room. Brock shot Joey once with the revolver. West managed to get his car to start and left the scene with Wells and Hudgens. Brock fled in Charles and Joey's jeep. Wells and Hudgens were told not to say anything to the police. West sold his car for $7 and the killers told their respective families that they were going to Florida. Instead, they drove to Alabama and Mississippi in the jeep. On the road, they discussed fleeing to Mexico, but on the night of the 13th of December, West and Brock pulled into a rest stop near Vicksburg, Mississippi. After falling asleep, they woke up to find that Lieutenant Kirby Key Phelps, 26, was asleep in his Toyota next to them. The murders hadn't stopped yet. Lieutenant Phelps was travelling to San Francisco, where he had been reassigned from Jacksonville, Florida. He planned to visit his mother in Oklahoma City for Christmas, but he would never make it there. When Lieutenant Phelps woke up, he saw that West was pointing a gun at him. Brock handcuffed him. West then took Phelps into some nearby woods, while Brock moved the stolen objects from Corpsewood into the Toyota. When West tried to handcuff Phelps to a pine tree, he had to unlock the left cuff to do so. Seeing his chance, Phelps punched West but he wasn't able to get away. West shot him three times in the head, took his wallet and ID and fled. Lieutenant Phelps' body was eventually found by a Civil War relic hunter on the 15th of December. The day that Lieutenant Phelps' body was found was also the day that Raymond Williams stopped by Corpsewood. He knew Charles and Joey well. He'd spent time with the men before the murders, making a recording of Charles playing his harp while reciting William Blake's poem, The Tiger. On the 15th of December, Raymond had gone to Corpsewood to tell Charles and Joey about the death of a mutual friend. But upon seeing that the jeep wasn't there, he decided to return the next day. When he did, Raymond realised the jeep was still missing and that the kitchen door was full of bullets. The police were called and the bodies were found. Police soon realised that a jeep found abandoned in Louisiana was connected to Corpsewood. Brock had driven the jeep from the rest stop and into Louisiana before being picked up by West in Lieutenant Phelps's Toyota. Warrants were issued for West and Brock's arrest while they were in Texas. By this point, Wells and Hudgens had told the police what had happened at Corpsewood. The rifle used in the murders had been found in Brock's mother's trailer. On the 18th of December, West and Brock fell out. West wanted to go to Mexico, but Brock didn't. West later said Brock wanted to continue killing, while he didn't. 
the pair split up. Brock hitchhiked back to Georgia. An off-duty police officer gave Brock a ride, not realising he was a wanted man. The police found out Brock's location after he spoke to his mother on the phone and he was arrested. West was arrested after handing himself over to the authorities on Christmas Eve. In 1983, Brock accepted a plea deal. In exchange for a guilty plea, Brock was given a life sentence rather than a death sentence. This was because of his age. He admitted to killing Joey, but said that West had killed Charles. He confirmed that the murders had been planned. West went to trial. The death penalty was on the table. At his trial, West said, All I know is they were devils and I killed them. That's the way I feel about it. Both Charles and Joey were referred to as, quote, homosexual devil worshippers, end quote, throughout the trial, and West claimed that the men had drugged both himself and Brock with LSD. But West never mentioned being drugged until after the police had found the vials of LSD, and tests revealed that the homemade wine hadn't been spiked with any kind of drug. The jury eventually found West guilty and returned a sentence of death. But West was then thrown a lifeline. The Supreme Court in Georgia overturned West's conviction and ordered that he be re-indicted and given a new trial. This was because there was an imbalance in the male-to-female ratio in the original grand jury that had indicted West. A double jeopardy motion was filed for West and a deal was brokered. But the case went to trial again after West changed his mind. In 1985, West's guilty pleas were accepted and he was given two consecutive life sentences. Corpsewood is now nothing more than a ruin. The house and its outbuildings burned down in 1983 supposedly at the hands of a group of religious fanatics who wanted to exercise the building. Even though decades have passed since the murders, rumours of satanic worship, curses and hauntings still swirl around Charles, Joey and Corpsewood. People who have taken bricks from the property claim to have been given bad luck prompting them to return the bricks. During the investigation into the murders, police officers were aware of a presence as well as a feeling of being watched. Some believe that Charles and Joey themselves haunt the property. In her book called The Corpsewood Manor Murders in North Georgia, author Amy Petula mentions a story told to her while she was researching the case. A man told her of how he was dared to visit Corpsewood with friends one December day. When they arrived at the property, there were no other cars, but in the ruins of the house sat two men in lawn chairs. The men were friendly and told the group how they visited the site on the same day every year. The group chatted with the men for a while about the murders and, after a while, the group headed into the woods to explore. When they returned to the ruins, the two men had gone. When Amy Petula showed the storyteller Charles Scudder's picture, he went into shock. Charles was identical to one of the men he had seen that December day, and some wonder if Charles predicted how he would die. Found inside Corpsewood Manor was this self-portrait of Charles. In the painting, Charles is gagged and has five bullet wounds in his head. When a friend asked about the painting, Charles said, That's how I'm going to die.